Heavenly Father, I ask that you grant us all the presence of your Holy Spirit, pour your latter rain out upon us, take control of this presentation, that the message that you placed upon my mind and my heart could be clearly conveyed to the brothers and sisters around uh, the internet world that are listening to these things. Please bless us at this time with light from on high that would better prepare us uh, to be those servants that give this final warning message at this crisis time in earth's history. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we've been dealing with a series, Daniel's Last Vision. Um, Sister Charlene uh, was on the chat, and she asked, she made, I'm, not, I'm making no assumptions that she's watching this, but I'm going to put it in the record for her, uh, because she's been dealing with the issue of her husband and his brain tumor, so I know that she's been distracted from following closely this message. And she put on the chat, What's the significance of January 11th? Okay, so I'm going to just walk through here just briefly, and I mean just briefly. To start off, the significance is we've been looking at chiasms. This is the chiasm of future for America. The 30 years begin on November 9th, ended on November 9th. The very center was November 9th. Our point of reference for chiasms is the week that Christ can confirm the covenant with many. And we learn from that chiasm, 27 A.D. to 31 A.D. to 34 A.D., that the dead center of it is the cross. Therefore, when we look at chiasms, it's the center point that is the most defining waymark. Uh, for the chiasm of future for America, the defining waymark is that at the 2004 Prophecy School, the message of Daniel 11, 40 to 45 was put in place. Therefore, the, the message of this history here is the message of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, as it was represented when it was formalized in 1996, okay? So, this here, we were connecting, when we did this presentation, other chiasms to this history, and one of them was called, I called, the Levitical chiasm, and it's over here. Um, and in that one, the Levitical chiasm, we identify that the center of it, it begins on March 27, 2019, goes to March 27, 2021, and the center is March 27, 2020. This is where the 100 days of prayer is instituted by the Adventist Church and where the prayer is lifted by the Pope of Rome uh, because of the pandemic. It's a total of 731 days, which is July 31st, which is a type of July 18th, July 31st, Julian, July 18th, Gregorian. And this is teaching us about taking the message to Adventism. The first, March 27th, the presentations that took place there were dealing with where Adventism went astray and closed their door back in 1863. Um, the next one, the Midnight Chiasm, is what she was asking about. It's here, um, and we extended it out in this little study. This is the Levitical Chiasm here. The Midnight Chiasm, I'll just deal with it here. September 7th, November 9th, and January 1st, no, January 11th. This is the time period when the Lord is opening the message for the priests. And the message for the priest is July 18th, the message to give to the Levites. And January 11th, 63 days after November 9th, which was 63 days after September 7th. September 7th is 9-7, and 9 times 7 is 63. This 126-day period is a chiasm, the center of which it is midnight. Uh, midnight, November 9th, here... This 30-year chiasm began at midnight, November 9th, 1989. It ends 30 years later at midnight, November 9th, 2019. But it has a chiastic structure involved with the Lord opening the message to the priest, to Ezekiel, Isaiah, and John. And the message here on January 11th is the message to the Levites. Okay, And you'll see if you take this midnight chiasm here and you take it down here, you have the added component that this is the chiastic structure. 
but 63 d weeks later, okay, 63, 63, takes you to March 27th, and this is the March 27th chiasm here. I'm wanting you to think about the connections. I'm also wanting to clean out the board in advance of this presentation. This here, the omega line, I'm gonna take off and leave this and show one other chiasm um, before we get started into our actual study. 252 days later from July 18th takes us where? Does anyone know? Really? That's 525. Oh. Okay, the, if you want to go to December 25th, you're going to go over here to 1225, and this will be 273 from this waymark. So what is this waymark? It is March 27th, 2021. So I want you to see just briefly without a whole lot of dwelling on it, we have a chiastic structure here. The center point here is the message of July 18th. But this way mark is March 27th. What is March 27th? It's emphasizing the message to Adventism. Um, and this message is given to the priest at the midnight chiasm. The message to the Levites is structured in a chiasm, and this message of July 18th includes our understanding of both November 9th and March 27th. Okay, um, that being said, I'm gonna take all of this off. We have a big chiasm up here. Um, so my answer to Sister Sh Charlene is that January 11th of this year is when the Lord took Gideon down into the enemy's camp and he heard the dream and the interpretation thereof and that's where the elements of Daniel's last vision were opened up for us to see and this is one of the other chiastic structures that we've recognized. This one, this being the center point, end point, starting point, ending point. This one, the center point is March 27th but it is preceded by a chiasm of 126, 63, 63, and it's followed by a chiasm. This is a, a very profound chiastic structure, so to speak. But all of these, we need to study these as intently as we've studied 27 AD, 31 AD, and 34 AD, because that's where the point of reference is for chiastic structures. And what does Christ do in that chiastic structure, in that history that is a chiastic structure from AD 27 to AD 34? What did Christ do? He confirmed the covenant. If we're going to be his covenant people, we need to understand the significance of these chiasms. He speaks to his covenant relationship when he speaks of these things. Now, Stephen sent in a correction, but it really wasn't a correction, but it was a correction. Um, and it's made me diverge a little bit. Right now, we are dealing with one, I'm switching gears here, one of the four kingdoms that's in Daniel's last vision. What are the four kingdoms that are in Daniel's last vision? The dragon, the beast, the false prophet, and the kingdom of the 144,000. We're now in the process, we begin looking at the kingdom of the beast, of the papacy. Why would that be significant? Because of our scripture reading. It is Rome that establishes the vision. The beast, the papacy, is Rome. This particular kingdom, the story of this kingdom that is structured on the story of Fatima, is what establishes this vision. So there are elements in the storyline of the kingdom of the beast that's structured upon the story of Fatima in Daniel's last vision that are of supreme importance to understand. Uh, we will show you some that you probably have not recognized as we proceed through this study. We've went through two or three presentations getting into it and then Stephen corrected me, okay? But he didn't correct me, but he did. Stephen from Ireland. When I went to, when I recognized these things, I began to grapple with 
uh, how they line up on the four kingdoms. And I, I very quickly realized that the liberals in the story of the United States, their victory was the impeachment. Okay? So I just, I marked impeachment of Donald Trump as Rafia and his acquittal. acquittal as Paneum in his history. That's all I was worried about. So I went into the newspapers and I dug out the information that they wrote up the articles of impeachment on 1210. I didn't care about the date, okay? And the acquittal was on February 5th. What I was dealing with is liberals win, conservatives win, Rafia, Pania. But what he pointed out is that they didn't vote the impeachment papers. They didn't vote to accept them until the 18th. And when he did that, it turned on lights that we have to deal with this morning. Okay, so that's what your notes are going to be about because when you when you get technical about when the impeachment papers were voted, this means that from this point to this point was 49 days. And 49 days becomes a key to see things in this history that have not been seen before. Okay, so we're going to walk through some things and most of this is review. On page one of your notes, Matthew 24, Verse 33 through 39 is where we'll start. Matthew 24, verse 33 says, So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. Matthew is giving the same commentary that you can find in Mark, and you can find it in Luke. But when you go to Luke on this commentary that you are, we're looking at in Matthew 24. In Luke, you can see the prophetic structure that allows you to prove that the generation that is alive at 9-11 is the last generation. Those details are not here in Matthew 24, but they are in Luke 21. And what chapter are they in Luke 21? Chapter 21. What's 21? Midnight. Okay, but Matthew 24... Verily I, verse 34, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, now the reason I'm putting that place is, put in place is, is we were told that the end of the world will be like the time of Noah, and part of the story of Noah is Lamech. Okay, and Lamech, how old was Lamech when he died? 777 years. And if we were to go over here on this line, because it's already in place, and change this to November 9th, 2019, and go out here to December 25th, 2021, um, and I'll get rid of these for us. Oh, I could have started right there. I already have, had it up there. How many days are there there? From here to here is 777 days. Okay. And how old was Lamech when he died? And you've seen, you've seen the presentations where you can put Lamech's, um, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, all on this line coming down to here where you put Noah, where the door closes. So all, the days of Noah are repeated in our history. 
And were the days of Noah governed by time? Yes. 120 years will the Lord strive with man. Okay. Okay, so in your notes, you can see it. Um, the breakdown of this 25, of this 777 is 252 and 525. You see that in your notes. And the 252 takes us to July 18th, 2020. And this is the history of 777. Um, and this was the Sabbath. I'm just going to put a, a 7, a 7, and a 7. But these are representing that each of these dates are a Sabbath. So you've got a second witness here to this history being 777, right? We've, we've had several presentations on this. This is just a review. Um, there's a chiasm from November 9th to July 18th to March 27th. This, this is that chiasm I showed you. And this is a Sabbath, this is a Sabbath, and this is a Sabbath. Of course, this is a Sabbath too, but this is just this chiastic structure that's in here. Going to here, to March 27th. Okay, so now in your notes you have this graph. And now we're going to switch gears. That This is just review on 777. I hope that this is clicking for you. That we're in the history of 777. June 22nd. Now we're going to talk about June 22nd. This is also review. Je Samuel Snow's June 22nd letter. Some time ago, Theodore pointed out a, a line of Samuel Snow that is from Millerite history about the development of the Midnight Cry message in the Millerite history and the way marks were marked by when he wrote letters and when those letters got published in the publications of that history. Okay, and the, the way marks on that line connect with the way marks of Ezekiel's prophecy, the way marks of Revelation 9, and the way marks of the history of future for America. There's, they're not just random, they're, they're airtight connections. And one of those way marks that I want to point out is June 22nd. Samuel Snow's letters and publications were way marks. His third letter was written on June 22nd, 1844. You see the, this, the diagram below, if you're not familiar with this. This date was the biblical date, Sivan 6, or the sixth day of the third month. Sixth day of the third month is a symbol of 63. Do you see any 63s popping up? See, 63s popping up all up over the place because 126s pop up all over the place. And generally, those 126s are identifying a chiastic structure, like here and like was over there before I erased it. Okay? And this is in the history of Samuel Snow's letters as well, this chiastic structure. Okay? But the chiastic structure ends on June 22nd in 1844. Uh, which, using the biblical date, is a symbol of 63, and it was Pentecost. So June 22nd represents the number 63, and it represents Pentecost, if you can find second witness to, witnesses to that. Turn to the next page. June 22nd, if you were going to express it using the American calendar, it would be 622, right? If you were using the European calendar, it would be 22-6. But 622, 6-22 is June 22nd. So June 22nd symbolizes Pentecost, symbolizes the number 63, but it also represents 622, and 622 is in Ezekiel's prophecy, in his Josiah prophecy. It was in 622 B.C. that Josiah held the Passover, that is one of the waymarks in that history. So 622 B.C. is a significant waymark, but so is 622 A.D. Okay, because 622 A.D. is when Muhammad makes his flight from Mecca. 
and that's significant to Islam, that is when Islam starts its calendar. Is based upon when Muhammad fled from Mecca, and that was in 622. So I want you to see that 622, which symbolizes June 22nd, 622 BC and 622 AD are both waymarks that we need to understand. You follow me? One of them is a waymark of Passover, one of them is a waymark that represents Islam. June 27, 622 is symbolic of 622. 622 is associated with Islam. Ezekiel 1.1 references this year. Ezekiel 1.1. Where do we find Ezekiel 1.1? On these boards. At midnight. Where's the midnight chiasm? The midnight chiasm is, is right here. Right here. This is Ezekiel 1.1. Okay, now you have Ezekiel 1 1 in your notes. It says, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kibar, that the heavens were opened and I saw the visions of God. In Millerite history, when was the fifth day of the fourth month? July 21st. Okay, there's your reference to midnight from the Ezekiel 1.1. But what is it also? What also can we see in the fourth month and the fifth day? You can see the number 45. Alright, but in the reference, now it came to pass in the 30th year. When was the 30th year? This is the 30th year here in our history of this movement. The chiasm of Future for America begins on November 9th, 1989 and it ends 30 years later on November 9th, 19, 2019. So we're lining up things that are taking place right here in this center point of the midnight chiasm. But the verse says it references the 30th year. The 30th year of what? Okay, for me, um, what am I? What, what's, it's 2020, I'm, I'm 69? 68. 68. I'm gonna, this is my 68th year, all right? All right, so what does it mean in the verse that in the 30th year? And, and I'll read it for you. Yeah, yeah okay, technically, I'm, if we're inclusive, I'm in my 69th year, okay? But if I'm going to add the ninth month, I'm probably in my 70th year. But who knows? The 30th year reference is to the Passover of Josiah in 622 B.C. So Ezekiel 1.1, when it says the 30th year, he, Ezekiel 1.1 is taking place 30 years after Josiah's Passover, and Josiah's Passover was 622 B.C. So, in this history here, you also have 622 referenced, 622 B.C., which would be June 22nd. All on this line at midnight. You follow me? You may, you may not be able to jump up here and repeat this, but you got the notes. If you read the notes out loud, you could repeat it. Okay, the entire reign of the kings of Judah is 391.5 years from the dividing of the king in early 977 B.C. to the death of Zedekiah in the summer of 586. 622 B.C. is in Ezekiel's Josiah prophecy and also in the history of Islam. 622, not B.C., but A.D., 622 A.D. is the year from which the... It, from which the Islamic calendar is counted using the year of Muhammad's flight from Mecca. You follow what I'm saying? That's when they started the calendar, their calendar. Okay, but notice Muhammad's flight from Mecca and the starting date was at sunset July 18th, 622. <laughs> Did you catch that? So not only is 622 a a symbol at BC, it's a symbol at AD, but when it comes to the Islamic calendar, 622 also has associated with it July 18th. Is July 18th a symbol of Islam? Okay, so 
just working through what J June 22nd represents. June 22nd, 2011, Future for America received 165,000 to start the school in Arkansas, this campus. But it didn't really receive $165,000 for this school. Because when, when we were asked if we had any needs, we gave them three needs. Uh, we need 10,000 for something going on in Af Africa, Ghana, I believe. 5,000 for Ghana, 10,000 for some video equipment. We needed 150,000. We got 150 for this school on June 22nd, 2011. And three years later to the very day, we begin the first camp meeting that's dealing with the opening light of Ezra 7-9 on June 22nd, 2014. So in our movement, June 22nd, it has 150 connected with it, $150,000, 150 is kind of a number we're grappling with here recently, and it's the point in time where Ezra 7-9, the first step in the midnight cry, began here three years later to the very day. Um, from, on any calendar, on any Gregorian calendar, from June 22nd, to December 25th, okay, if you're going to put June 22nd here and go to June, or December 25th, how many days is it? It's 187 days every time. June 22nd to December 25th is 187. So there's a connection between June 22nd and 187. I want to show you some of these connections. It's in your note. The symbol 187 represents July 18th. 718 U.S. calendar. 1887 European calendar. Therefore, June 22nd is 187. They're the same symbol, only inverted using European application. You follow me? Yes? So, do you see the, the June 22nd connection with 187 developing? Mm -hmm. Okay, so from the biblical first day of the first month. It is 187 days to the 10th day of the 7th month. What is the 10th day of the 7th month in the biblical calendar? It's the Day of Atonement. So in the biblical calendar, from the first day of the biblical calendar to the Day of Atonement is 187 days. I really just count it out. <laughs> All right. Um, it's the 10th day of the 7th month, is it not? So you've got six full months, six times 30 is what? 180. 180 plus 10 days is 190. But when you do the actual application to the Hebrew calendar 39, 29, or 30, 29, 30, 29, it's 187 days. Okay. Um, Samuel, Samuel Snow's presentation at Boston on July 21st, 1844, was predicting that on the 10th day of the seventh month, Christ would come, and it was midway between the first day of the first month and the 10th day of the seventh month, thus creating a chiasm. From April 19th to July 21st is 93 and a half days, to October 22nd is another 93.5 days. What is 93.5 times 2? 187, okay, 187. So this 187 in the history of the Millerites in the biblical calendar forms a chiasm with July 18th being at the center. July 21st, I'm sorry. Are you getting it? Are you seeing that or am I moving too fast? You're getting part of it. Okay, I'm going to put that up there so you get this. From the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the 7th month in Millerite history, to the midpoint, July 21st, this is 721, this is um, October 22nd, this is April 19th, you have 93.5 days, 93.5 days, therefore you have, as we've already said, 187. Okay, therefore, 187 is a symbol of 1022. It's a symbol of the Day of Atonement. 
Okay, what happens on the Day of Atonement? Change of dispensation, closed door. And what is 718? It's July 18th. July 18th is October 22nd, as we have already been talking about. And July 18th is also June 22nd. Why? When did the Islamic calendar begin? On July 18th, 622 A.D. Okay, these, I'm wanting you to see these connections. Moving on. The first public presentation of Rafi and Paniam came on December 17th to July 18th, 2020. From the first public presentation of Rafi and Paniam, December 17th, 2016 to July 18th, 2020, is 187 weeks. I don't know if that's phrased right. It should read, it should read, from the opening up of Rafia and Paniam yeah. on December 17th, 2016, to July 18th, 2020, is 187 weeks. Okay, so change that in your notes so you don't go back in later and it beat you up. Now this one, here's a little bit of conjecture, not conjecture, sanctified conjecture. December 25th, 2021 is the 186th Sabbath, right here. This is the 186th Sabbath since June 9th, 2018, where in Italy the Sabbath was closed at 9.11 p.m. From the prayer on June 9th, 2018, Sabbath to Sabbath, January 1st is 100 and 87 Sabbaths. The conjecture here is that this is Sabbath 186 here. And you got to go one more week over here to get to the 187th Sabbath from the, the miracle of the Sabbath close at the Italian camp meeting. And the point is, is right here is the first Sunday of the Sunday Law. Okay, so that's a little bit of sanctified conjecture, but next page. Donald Trump and 777. Donald Trump and 777. Now I have a challenge. I know the people watching on the internet, the people in this room don't need to be challenged this way. But this is for the people of the world, or whoever is antagonistic to this message. I challenge you. To t with two challenges, if I can remember the second part of this challenge. We're going to show you the phenomenon of how 7 or 77 or 777 pops up in the history of Donald Trump. My challenge to you is, take any other president of the previous 44 presidents, put them on the timeline of their presidency, and manifest any kind of chronological revelation that comes close to this. Show me just one other president that you mathematically can begin to produce these kinds of numbers. And then the second challenge is, if this is fanaticism that we're wrapped up in, tell me why Satan would go to so much trouble to orchestrate history, to make sure that these waymarks of Donald Trump that produce the 777s are produced in order to lead a small, little, tiny, insignificant group of people on planet Earth into this fanaticism at the end of the world. Why would Satan take so much trouble to control the historical events, to put these stumbling blocks in front of maybe 300 people on planet Earth at the end of the world? So, so answer those two for me. Show me another president that can produce this kind of mathematical equations, and then tell me why Satan would go to the trouble to produce these counterfeits, if that's what you're saying they are. Okay, Donald Trump and 777. Election day, November 8th, and on some of these I'm going to refer to November 8th, and some of them November 9th, because he, they, he was elected on November 8th, was he not? But 
he didn't go over the top. They weren't done counting until when? November 9th. Okay, so you got some wiggle room there. The counting wasn't done until late, early in the morning of November 9th. Election day, November 8, 2016, was Benjamin Netanyahu's seventh year, seventh month, and seventh day in office. I'm just showing you now the connection between Donald Trump and Israel. Is there a connection between the United States and Israel? Yes. Oh, the one is the literal glorious land. The United States is the spiritual glorious land. Is the glorious land a component to this message? Yes. Absolutely. So you're seeing now a connection between literal glorious land and spiritual glorious land with Betan Netanyahu, okay? When he was elected, Trump was elected, it was Netanyahu's seventh year, seventh month, and seventh day in office. Trump was born seven days, 700 days before Israel declared independence. Therefore, 777 days after Trump's birth, modern Israel was 77 days old. The opening ceremony for the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem was May 14, 2018 at 4 p.m., exactly 70 years to the hour since Israel's first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, stood up and read the Israeli Declaration of Independence on May 14, 1948. The embassy's opening ceremony was 700 days after Trump's 70th birthday. And here's two coins that have been minted in Israel. This is the front and back of one coin. If you can read it, on the bottom, the one on the left-hand side with the picture of Trump and Cyrus behind him. That's King Cyrus behind Trump. It says on the bottom, and he charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem. Okay, and Donald Trump built a house in Jerusalem. He moved the embassy there because they're talking about the temple that Cyrus built. But that's how many in Israel relate to Donald Trump, is that he's a modern Cyrus. Okay, now Trump's presidency. There are 273 days from June 16, 2015, when he announced his candidacy to March 15, 2016, when he won the nomination. So he announces his candidacy, and 273 days later, he wins the nomination. What's 273? It's March 27th. It's the European expression of March 27th. Okay? Trump won the electoral vote 304 to 227. 304 minus 227 is he won by 77. There were people that he won. There were some electors that he won that didn't vote for him. How many? Seven. But Hillary had five that jumped ship with her, too. So out of the 12, seven went for Trump. He won 30 states. Is that a prophetic number? Hillary won 21. Is that a prophetic number? Now, how do you have 50 states and they win 51? Now I'm sounding like Barack Obama, who thought there was, what, 53 states? Isn't that the Islamic number of states? They're counting the, the District of Columbia here, okay, to make up the 51. There are 72. What's 72? It's a symbol of 144. What's 144 a symbol of? 144,000, okay. There are 72 days from November 8th slash 9th, to January 20th, when he was inaugurated. And January 20th is a 120, 2020. You see the, the symbolisms of these numbers and these dates? January 20th, 2017, Trump was 70 years old, seven months, and seven days old. Lamech, 220 days after his birthday on June 14th, 2016. This was the rabbinic year of 5777. But on the, on the coin, that's to fulfill 70 years, too. Yeah, and on the coin, it says to fulfill 70 years from the, the scriptures as well. All right, good for you. I'm going to pass that one. Trump's Raphia Tupinium. Over here, I've got Raphia Paneum. This is Trump's Raphia and Paneum. Let me see. I've got time. I want to make this a little bit prettier, just a little bit. 
Okay, so I'm going to take this one down. We're going to focus on this now. Trump's Rafia was December 12th. 12? 17, 2019. That's when they passed the impeachment papers. Yeah, okay. That's what I meant. Here, February 5th, 2020, which is, of course, the 2520. Okay, this, I'm saying, is Trump's Rafia. And this is Trump's Paneum. Now, this isn't the Rafia and Paneum, the perfect fulfillment of it in Daniel 11. We've said this several times. The perfect fulfillment of Rafia and Paneum in Daniel 11 is July 18th is Rafia, December 25th is Paneum. But we have four kingdoms, and they're all... The, the three externals are speaking to the internals. Okay, so we see the same dynamics though. This is liberals prevail, conservatives prevail. Okay, that's the battle of Rafia, the battle of Paneum. The search for impeachment papers began on January 20th, 2017, on Inauguration Day. I've already put this in the public record. I put in an article from the Washington Post. The first day of his presidency, they began to search for reasons to impeach him. 977 days later, the, the official impeachment investigation began on September 24th, 2019. Did you catch that? 977 days later, after his inauguration, he was inaugurated over here on January 20th, 2017, and 977 days later, on September, that's eight, nope, nine, 924, date 2019, the official, come on, all right, you follow the logic here. So, 77 days later, this is what I plugged in there, 77 days later, on December 10th, this would be here, 12, 10, 2019, the, impe the impeachment papers are written. Okay, they're written here. And here they're voted on. So... This is 77 days, and this is eight days later. Okay. 977, a prophetic number. How about 77? How about eight? Absolutely. Okay, it's, eight is part of Trump's story. Okay, Paneum. Trump is acquitted on February 5th, 2020. From December 18th, and this is where Stephen corrected me. 49 days. Is that a prophetic number? What is it? It's a, among, among other things, it's a 490. It's a probationary period from here to here. Is the 490 in the foundation and central pillar of Adventism? Amen. Daniel 8, 14, under 2300 days, the first 70 weeks, 490 years. Is 49 part of the Jubilee cycle? Is it part of the Feast of Weeks? 49 is a symbol that has so many elements connected to it that the fact that it's in there begins to teach several things. You know what it teaches? It teaches that this is paneum for, for Donald Trump. But what else is it? It's Pidna. 
Everyone raise your hand if you know that it's Pidna also. Let's see the hands go up. Anyone out there raising their hands? This is Pidna. Let me show you that it's Pidna. What is Pidna? Okay, we're heading that direction. 18 for, now, this is a symbol here of October 22nd, 1844. This is, this is what Stephen put in the mix. This here, it's February 5th, right there. At, on October 22nd, 1844, do you have a conclusion of a 2520? Yes. Okay, so you can see here, 10, 22, 44, but there's, there's more evidence of this. Let's read through this. 1844 is the end of a 2520 beginning in 677. 1844 is the end of the Great Jubilee. Did you know that? Did you know the Millerites taught that? The Great Jubilee, they, had, they taught, began in 607. 607 is when they started the Great Jubilee. What took place in 607? In a jubilee, a, a, a full jubilee would be 50 cycles, and there'd be 49 times 50 to make the great jubilee equals what? It equals 2450. Oh. This is Millerite application. And if you be if you start in 607 and add 2450 days to it, I better make sure I'm getting my math right, where do you come to? 607, what would you do? This is BC. You never answered what happened in 607 BC. What's 607 from 2450? Does 1843 touch 1844? Yes. yes, okay. So this is Millerite understanding. It doesn't make it on the chart, but they were teaching it at this time. That the Great Jubilee ended where October 22nd, 1844 concludes as well. So you have a 2300, you have a Great Jubilee, and you have a 2520 all ending in 1844. You can see that in your notes. This has the element of 607 from 677. What's 677? 607 is the beginning of the Great Jubilee. What's 677? It's the beginning of the 2520. What's 457? It's the beginning of the 2300. What I'm claiming here is that all three of these prophecies come to 1844. And uh, my second claim is is that we can see this represented by this 49 days, that this way mark will manifest the characteristics of these three prophecies. Am I losing you here? Okay, so what I want you to see here is that 607 from, well, we take 457 and 677 to produce what? 220, right? There's 220 years between 457 and 677. Yes? How many years between 677 and 70? And how many years from 457 to, to 607? Zero, five, one. Is 150 a number? Is it 150? Okay, it'd be 500. 50 and 50 is 607. Okay, so that math is right. So these three prophecies, when you get to the conclusion, they carry with them these values. You follow me? Therefore, these three values, I'm saying, would be represented on. February 5th, 2020, if Stephen's claim, <laughs> hang it on him, if his claim that this 49 
takes us to a way mark that's represented as October 22nd, 1844. So we can keep this simple because this is not the point of this. This 2300 days is clearly represented here because it's 49, the number 49 is there. That's the 2300 year prophecy, 490 years, okay? Um, the the 2520 is represented there, here, because of the date. And in the recent weeks, we have shown that the 150 is represented in this history here. Okay, the 150 takes us to here. So all three of them are there at that way mark. Are you with me? Yes? Yes. Okay, December 18th. 2019 was Raphia for the false prophet. February 5th, 2020 was Paneum. February 5th, 2020 was also Pidna. And this is where our study begins. <laughs> With eight minutes left, okay? The Battle of Raphia. I'm telling you... Can I ask a question first? Pardon me? Can I ask a question real quick? Maybe. What is it? Uh, you came up with 150, but that would be a BC and an AD. Okay. And so wouldn't we come up with 1064 if we, if we add those numbers? 1064. 457, you'd, is it, you'd have to add those numbers to 607, wouldn't you? No, they're all BC. They're all BC. Yeah, it's not an AD. It's not an AD. None of them are I'm AD. Sorry, I was thinking, I'm sorry, my fault. I thought 457 was AD. I'm sorry. Really? I know it's not. Okay. I can't read it because my screen's too blurry. Sorry. All right. So you threw me for a second. But we're not going to get it. We're not going to open up the questions here. We're on the threshold of our study. Go ahead. He's still going to say what happened for us in 607. We never answered that, and I don't know either. No one knows what happens in... No one is a... Daniel was taken captive. Uh, Daniel was taken captive. And which, which attack of Nebuchadnezzar was that? Third. Second. Second. First. First. Right? Okay, first yeah. attack. All right, so, I, it, it, and that's why I didn't address it. I, uh, that's something that we should know, okay? Anyway, anyway. Let's move on to the Battle of Raphia. I want to tell you about the Battle of Pydna, but I want to tell you about the Battle of Raphia first. And I've set some premises here that you can get the significance even if you don't comprehend every bit of history we're going to refer to here. On the bottom of page 4, the Battle of Raphia, also known as the Battle of Gaza, was a battle fought on... When was it fought? It was fought on June 22nd, 2017. Have you heard of June 22nd? June 22nd in the year 217, okay? So what I'm saying is right away, right away, forget, all, forget the history of the battle. You know that Rafia has connected with it. It has Islam connected with it, 622 AD. It has the Passover connected to it, 622 BC. It's the 30th year of midnight, has midnight connected to it, takes place in the history of the 45th President of the United States. It is midnight, it's July 21st, it's also June 22nd. It has all of these characteristics connected to it, and here's where the Battle of Raphia takes place in the year 2000, not the year 217, okay? And it's between who? The king of the south and the king of the north. And who wins? Ptolemy, the king of the south. Okay, the liberals. The impeachment. Alright, next page. I want to just tell you something about the third Macedonian war. Everyone know how many Macedonian wars there were? There were four. <laughs> okay, but they were all over by the third one. The the Macedonians were conquered at the third one, but they rebelled again. They had one of the Macedonians rebelled, and Rome came in and dealt with him in the fourth. They call it the Fourth War. 
but there was really only three. Who is it be between? I just told you on purpose. It wasn't between Antiochus and Ptolemy, the king of the south and the king of the north. The Macedonian wars were between Macedon and Rome. You with me? It's two different antagonists. Yes? Okay, let me read this to you. The Third Macedonian War, 171 to 168, was a war fought between the Romans, Roman Republic and King Persis of Macedon. In 179 BC, King Philip the fifth of Macedon died and was succeeded by his ambitious son Persis. He was anti-Roman and stirred up anti-Roman feelings around Macedonia. Tensions escalated and Rome declared war on Macedon. After each of the first three Macedonian wars, the Rome, Romans went back to Rome after punishing or otherwise dealing with the Macedonians and re receiving some reward from the Greeks. When the fourth Macedonian war began as the result of a Macedonian rebellion fomented by a man who claimed to be Persis his son, Rome again stepped in. This time, Rome stayed in Macedonia. Macedonian and Epirus were then made a Roman province. The war was over at the third one. When was the war over? It was over in 168. This is history. This is pioneer understanding. This is Uriah Smith. This is 168, you see it in there at the very top, the third Macedonian war, 171 to 168 BC. The Third Macedonian War ended in 168 BC. All right, this is a subject of prophecy. Uriah Smith comments on it. We're going to read his comments in a moment. But this is not a war between Ptolemy and Antiochus. It is not a war between the king of the south and the king of the north. It's a war between Rome and Macedon before Rome even comes into prophetic history before Rome even comes into prophetic history. This is important to note. It is the subject of our scripture reading. And for some reason, Daniel left one word out of the scripture reading. He may not know it, but you corrected him. He still didn't hear it. And if he doubts it, he can go back and look at the tape. But it is the word that I want to focus on. Go to, go to Daniel eleven fourteen. So you did it to help me emphasize this, and you did not know it. Daniel eleven fourteen. Many, many tekel yafarsin. What did he leave out of verse 14? He left many. He says, in those times there shall stand up against the king of the south. And Kathy said, many. He says, and in those times shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. Okay, so there's a time period where the whole world's going to turn against Egypt. That's what this verse is saying. Many people are going to stand up against Egypt. Pioneers, you can read your eyes, Smith, he'll tell you this. And it's at this point that Rome, who's still not a subject of prophecy, it's going to come to the aid of this Egyptian king. And who is, what is the Egyptian king? What is he? You've got to know this. What is he? He's an eight-year-old child. Okay, the, the king had died and left Egypt to his son that's eight years old. And now all these warlike nations says, let's go conquer Egypt. It's easy prey. And Rome's going to insert itself into that history and say, we're going to protect that child. Protect that child. Okay, so in verse 14 is the first place you can infer Rome coming into history. But verse 14 is marking Rome. It says... Um, also the robbers of thy people, that's Rome, shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. This is the, this is the point of reverend that we've been, reference we've been using to understand Daniel's last vision. And I want to show you something from verse 14 you may not have seen before. Your next reference in your notes. 49 years later, the Battle of Pydna. Battle of Pydna, 168 BC. The Battle of Pydna occurred during the Third Macedonian War. It was fought on when? June 22nd. 168 BC. From Raphia to Pydna is how many years? 
what is 168 from 217? Am I doing am I doing I'm doing it wrong probably because I'm going backwards in history. 217. I know the answer, but no, I was doing it right. What's eight from seven? Eight from seven is nine, is it not? That turns this one into a zero. And what's 16 from 20? 49. From the Battle of Raphia to the Battle of Pydna is 49 years exactly to the very day. June 22nd, 2000 BC, 217 BC to June 22nd, 168 BC. Here is Raphia king of the south, king of the north. Here's Paneum, king of the south, king of the north. But 49 years later is Pydna, Rome, against Macedon. Alright? You with me? It's important you stay with me. There's something that you got to see here. This is Uriah Smith. Something you got to see here. You got to see this. You have to see this. Uriah Smith says, Rome was of such a separate horn, and from the standpoint of this prophecy, came out of one of the horns of the goat. Who's the goat? Greece. What's another word for Greece in that history? Macedon. Okay. Thus answering exactly to the prophetic description. Why it was represented as coming out of one of the horns of the goat will be clearly seen from the following facts. In the year 161 BC, Rome became connected with the Jews by the famous... Jewish League. Nations are mentioned in prophecy when their history becomes interwoven with that of God's people. So what Uriah Smith saying is here, Rome isn't going to be identified until 161 BC. Pydna is 168. Raphia is 217. Rome's not identified until seven years after this date. Okay, that's when it comes into prophetic history. You've got to see this. You've got to follow this. Therefore, in the year 161, the conquering legions of the Roman power came into the prophet's view. But just seven years before this, B.C. 168, at the Battle of Pydna, in June 22, 168, Rome had conquered Macedonia, one of the four horns of the goat, adding it to its empire. The prophet was viewing the horns of the goat, and when Rome had made the Macedonian horn part of itself, and seven years later came into the field of the prophet's visions by its league with the Jews, he would speak, he would of course speak of it from this point of view as coming from the horn, forth of that horn, as if coming from that horn, the prophet beholds it from that point, pursuing its triumphant career. Okay. <coughs> in this history here, Rome isn't going to be seen in prophecy till here. But in this history here, in the middle of this history, this is 217 B.C. This is 168 B.C. Would you say that 200 B.C. is in the middle, roughly? I'm not saying identical math. I'm just saying that's the middle of that history. Are you with me? So what I'm saying is, between the vote to impeach and the rejection of the vote to impeach, in this 49 days, that in these 49 years, there's something significant that happened in the year 200 BC that would be typifying something that would happen in our history. And what happened, we've read in verse 14 of Daniel 11. In this history here, many would stand up against Egypt. Why? Because of its child king. Okay, and it's Egypt. But the robbers of thy people, these people over here, Rome, they're going to become the defender. Alright, so I'm saying that somewhere before, between December 18th, 2019 and February 5th, 2020, we should find some kind of historical event in our history that corresponds to this history if this is actually illustrating anything of significance. 
Okay. Um, go to page, I, I, I don't know how I have this out of order, but I do. Go to uh, page six. I'm, I'm passing over some stuff. I will definitely come back to this stuff. On page six, you see verse 14. In those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. And then you see B.C. 200. This is Uriah Smith, same passage that I just read. A new power is now introduced, the robbers of thy people. Literally, says Bishop Newton, the breakers of thy people. Far away on the banks of the Tiber, a kingdom had been nourishing itself with ambitious project and dark designs. Small and weak at first, it grew with marvelous rapidity in strength and vigor, reaching out cautiously here and there to try its prowess and test the vigor of its warlike arm, till conscious of its power, it boldly reared its head among the nations of the earth and seized with invincible hand the helm of the, their affairs. Henceforth, the name Rome stands upon the historic page destined for long ages to control the affairs of the world and exert a mighty influence among the nations even to the end of time. Rome spoke, and Syria and Macedonia soon found a change coming over the aspect of their dream. The Romans interfered in behalf of the young king of Egypt, determined that, should, that he should be protected from the ruin devised by Antiochus and Philip. This was the year 200 BC. You follow me? and was one of the first interferences, important interferences of the Romans in the affairs of Syria and Egypt. Next page, page 7. This is from two different news sources. The first one is the Washington Post. January 24th, 2020. 1, 24, 2020. Is that in between... December 18th and February 5th. Yes. Yes, it is. This is from the Washington Post. Vice President Pence in Israel marked the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. He slipped a prayer into Jerusalem's western wall and bowed his head, and he visited with Pope Francis here in Rome before gazing upward at the Sistine Chapel. He went both to Israel and Rome. He went to both Israel and Rome, which are subjects of prophecy, but notice the next paragraph. But Pence's whirlwind 77-hour trip abroad was nearly as notable for what he didn't do and didn't say as for what he did. And then they go on to speak about he, how he didn't mention the impeachment process. But what kind of trip was he on? A 77-hour trip. What 77 represent? The presidency of Donald Trump. Okay. Now, from the Va one of the Vatican news sources, that very same trip, January 24th, it says this. After Pope Francis and U.S. Vice President Mike Prince Pence met privately for nearly an hour at the Vatican, Pence told the Pope that his Roman Catholic mother will be pleased with the visit. Thank you, Your Holiness. You have made me a hero, said Pence, who was raised Catholic but became an evangelical Christian. Neither the Vatican nor the Vice President's office were expected to issue a statement on the issues discussed in their private meeting. However, Pence tweeted that the two discussed today's March for Life, Venezuela, and displaced minorities in the Middle East. Today's March for Life. What was the March for Life? Well, they have it annually in Washington, D.C. Donald Trump, first president, actually attended to that. Okay, it didn't take place, it didn't take place on this date, it took place on the day of this article. But the Pope and Pence discussed it. What was the March to Life about? Abortion. Who's pro-abortion? The globalists. Egypt. Is it okay to call the globalists Egypt? So here we have an issue where Egypt is killing children. At the same point in time, the United States and Rome are having a discussion about killing children that lines up with the way mark where Rome came in to protect the child king of Egypt. Do you see that? 
You follow the logic there? Back to Smith. This was BC 200. This is where I cut off. And I'll just drop down to the bold face. Talking about the dad that died. Yet no sooner was the king dead, leaving behind an infant whom the laws of humanity and justice enjoined them not to disturb in the possession of his father's kingdom, then they immediately joined in criminal allegiance and excited each other to shake off their lawful heir and divide his dominions between them. In this history of 217 to 200 to 168 BC, Rome inserts itself into history because to protect the children, a child of Egypt. This history is lining up with 1218 to 25 2020 and in this history in a 77 hour whirlwind tour not only does Pence go to Israel he goes and visits the Pope and their discussion is about protecting the children of Egypt the world do you see the application and where is that application come from comes from our scripture reading, Daniel 11, 14. And at that time shall many stand up. Okay, now back to page 5. What I'm saying is, Pidna is a battle that takes place at this way mark. But it's not a battle between the king of the south and the king of the north. That's Rafi and Paneum. This is a battle in history between Rome and Greece, Rome and Macedon. So we should see something here that Pidna typifies because June 22nd, June 22nd, 49 years apart, 49 days apart. We should see something here at Pidna that has to do with Rome inserting itself in a and making a victory, a, a battle victory, that's represented by Pitna, Pidna, because Rome won that battle. So did anything happen on February 5th, 2020, concerning the Vatican? This is from the Vatican newspaper. February 5th. The International Monetary Fund said on Wednesday that now was a very important moment for Argentina. The International Monetary Fund, the globalist financiers, were in Vatican City to discuss the economic crisis in Argentina. And the Pope is from Argentina. Okay, The Pope wasn't supposed to go to that meeting, but he's going to go to that meeting. Francis himself and Argentine made an unscheduled appearance at a conference in Vatican City where the two main participants were IF, IMF Managing Director Cristalina Georgieva and Argentine Economy Minister Martin Guzman. The Pope, who did not specifically mention the current Argentine crisis, called for a new form of solidarity to help indebted countries saying, we are not doomed to universal inequality. How does the Pope take the world captive? Small people. Okay, so he's inserting into the IMF discussion his philosophy about minorities. Poor people in heavily indebted countries bear overwhelming tax burdens and cuts in social services as their governments pay debts contracted insensitively and unsustainably, Francis said, adding that a country's debt policy can become a factor that damages the social fabric. I'm telling you that based upon prophecy, when he inserted himself into the IMF discussion there at Vatican City on February 2nd, 2020, the globalists were conquered. Greece was conquered. Greece is the globalists. And I'm telling you that Daniel 11, 40 to 45 says that when the papacy takes control of the world, go to Daniel 11. Daniel 11. There are certain things that are identified that the papacy takes control of. In verse 43 it says, But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. 
and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. What do you suppose gold and silver and precious things represent? Economics. Economics. He's already taken them captive. He's already won that battle. It's seven years later where he's going to come into history. And when he comes into history, he's going to conquer three entities. Doesn't pagan Rome conquer three entities? The east, the south, the pleasant land. What about papal Rome? The Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. So when modern Rome comes into history, it's got to conquer three it's three enemies all at the same time. The king of the south, the glorious land, and Egypt. When does he do that? When is the United States and the king of the south, the glorious land and the king of the south, conquered? At the Sunday law. What does the globalists do? What does Egypt do at the same time? They agree to give their kingdom unto the beast. Right here, he comes into history and he conquers them all at the same time. How many years did it take for Papal Rome to remove the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths? We put this in the record more than once. When the first horn was removed until the last horn was removed, how many years was that? It was from 493 to 538. What would that be? That would be 45 years. This is the Sunday law. This is the history from this point here, July 18th, to the Sunday law, represented by a 7. Can we plug a 7 in there from July 18th to December 25th? Seven, seven, seven. She got 777, seven, but you can plug a 7 in there. He's already conquered. Macedon, Greece, the world has already been subdued. And he took them right here on February 5th, 2020, at the Battle of Pydna, in fulfillment of Daniel's last vision. Now in your notes, I have for you to read on page 10. There are two quotes that I read two presentations ago. Having to do with Zechariah 5. And when I come back in the next presentation, I have to return to this and I put these back in here for you to read before now and then so they're, they're in your mind. There's still points to be drawn from these two quotes about the scroll, the roll flying through heaven. Remember in the, in the, the bat woman in the basket? Okay. Uh, because she, she asked a very provocative question um, in this, the last quote there. Second paragraph from bottom 10. When does the Lord say that the offering of Judah and Jerusalem shall be pleasant unto him as in the former years? And we got to show you that that is when the temple is cleansed. That's when the offering is pleasant. That's when the cup of iniquity for both Egypt, the Amorites, and Israel is full. Okay, so when did that temple get cleansed? At the midnight chiasm. 